Good day, fellow investors. The Interactive Investor team just did an amazing interview with Bill Ekman and they have kindly allowed me to share it. For more great interviews and great content about investing, please check their YouTube channel in the link in the description below. Now, before I start with the interview, just a comment and something that you can focus on while listening to the interview. I sense that Bill Ekman is now still the genius he always was, but he is now a humble genius. Always a genius, but with a great ego. Seven years ago, when he was fighting with Icon, now he says no more mistakes. So he's humble, focused, and that is also reflected in his performance. Of course, he has done greatly over time. And you can see here the Herbalife, Valiant issues, fighting and focusing on the wrong things. Then he, I think, learned his lesson and the humble Bill Ackman of now did something amazing over the last few years. And I believe that over the next few decades, it is very likely or the top leading person I would bet on to be the next Warren Buffett is exactly Bill Ackman. Plus, he has a concentrated portfolio of 10 great businesses, as you will hear in the interview, his strategy, which is something that can be great to learn, but also to invest in for us retail investors. And therefore, in the coming weeks, we will analyze all of Bill Ackman's positions. So subscribe for that and hit that notification bell to get notified when a new Bill Ackman stock is analyzed. I leave you to the amazing interview the Interactive Investor team has done. Hello, with me today I have star investor Bill Ackman, CEO of FUSI 100 company, Pershing Square Holdings. Hi Bill, thanks for joining me today. Great to talk again. Sure, good to see you. Um, a lot's happened since we last spoke at the end of last year. Um, the share price, the Pershing Square uh, share price has been a roller coaster ride and more recently uh, you've published half year results. Is the business where you want it to be and, and how would you summarise portfolio performance in 2022 so far? Actually, I feel quite good about 2022. Um, we've had some very significant profits uh, from hedges, uh, you know, decent percentage of which we've realized. So that gives us cash to deploy. Uh, that's offset some weakness in, I would say, stock price uh, performance. Uh, we've definitely, uh, you know, the, the, I think the last reported return uh, was probably something in the 13% range, something along those lines year to date. Uh, we're a bit ahead of the S and P, um, but uh, what I, we really focus on is the performance of the companies we own. And in almost every case, uh, with one uh, short-term glaring example, which was Netflix, which we can we, we can discuss, uh, we feel very very good about the businesses we own. Um, you know, Universal Music uh, continues to you know perform extraordinarily well and expected to for for decades to come. Uh, you know, really every company we own has reported. Uh, Good results, actually quite strong results. Management, you know, taking the right initiatives. We feel very good about the businesses. And what's happened is, you know, the move in rates has caused you know re-rating in multiples and and brought down kind of today's stock market value of these companies. Um, but we like them on January one at the prices where they traded, and we like them more today at at lower valuations. And we think, you know, sort of finally the Federal Reserve is getting aggressive about. Uh, tempering inflation, and I think that's important for the long-term value of these businesses. So as long as we don't, we're not in a world with runaway inflation forever. Um, you know, and even in that world, we own the kind of businesses for the most part that can protect themselves from inflation. So we like the companies we own. Uh, we like, uh, you know, the prices that were, where they trade, and then Pershing Square Holdings itself, the entity, the the discount to NAV has widened over the course of the year. So the, you know, the performance. Of the share price is disappointing to us because it includes further widening widening of the of the gap between NEV and, and share price. And uh, we we did launch a pretty aggressive share repurchase program. We're buying the maximum every day that we can uh, in the open market. And the benefit uh, for the long term investor, obviously, is canceling shares at a thirty five percent discount to NEV is quite a, a creative use of capital, particularly when NEV is comprised of businesses you really like that are trading it themselves cheap prices. So you're, we're buying back stock today 
the last time we sort of did the math, we sort of estimated kind of our, if, the, if you took the kind of fair value of everything we own and they traded that fair value, uh, that's a number, you know, comfortably in excess of $70 per share when we're buying back stock, you know, today at 32 or $33 a share. And I think that will inure to our benefit over the long term. Um, so, it, you know, obviously very interesting, challenging year for the world. Um, we try to own businesses that can withstand the test of time. And I think we've been successful in selecting them. Well, at Universal Music Group, which you, you mentioned, it's easily your biggest uh, position. And the stake was a, a, a drag on, on performance in the, in the first half. Has your view on the business changed at all? Are there improvements you want the company to make? And, and what's the relationship between you and the board? Uh, the relationship's excellent. Uh, in my first in-person board meeting, I just joined the board relatively recently. Uh, it's going to be uh, this coming October. Uh, you know, I've met the directors uh, by Zoom. Uh, but we have a great relationship with management. We love the business. I think it's a, it's a new board, uh, but you know, I think it looks to be a good board. No issues with anything the company's doing. I think there are certainly opportunities. Um, you know, the, uh, it's sort of a U.S. Uh, headquartered company with most of its, you know, about half its profits in America uh, listed on your next Amsterdam. And it, it suffers a little bit, I would say, from what Pershing Square Holdings suffers from. Uh, where the, the logical market for that stock is probably NASDAQ or, or the New York Stock Exchange. And, that, and that's something the company can address over time. But it's uh, the business is doing great. Earnings are up you know, well in excess of what we expected. We bought the, you know, made the deal to buy the stock in, in August of, uh, of last year. And uh, just the multiples come down. It's trading at you know, something under 20 times earnings for a business that we think can grow earnings at you know, 20% certainly high teens compounded for a long, long time in a, you know, really undisruptible business. Uh, you know, Ukraine is going through, you know, a tragedy and, uh, you know, but my guess is people are still listening to music in Ukraine. You know, it, it, it can appease, you know, the mind at, a, at, at tragic times. And it's, you know, it's a kind of universal language and uh, you're going to see more and more growth in music streaming over time. And I think it's pretty inevitable. So we like inevitable. Uh, companies and we think we have by far the best management team in the industry so there's nothing to complain about other than i would say in the short term perhaps the share price the other thing that is hurting the share price uh is the you know uh the translation of euro to dollars right this is uh a euro uh, uh list you know entity uh we we hedge our exposure to kind of universal's uh operating income in terms of its uh, euro and uh, other currency uh, exposures, we don't hedge, if you will, sort of the, the translation risk of the, of the of the of the stock price. So I think you know the earnings are better than expected. You know, partially because, um, you know, the, I, I would say the business is doing really really quite well. But uh, over time, we expect the market to give benefit for the fact that. Uh, you know, a lot of the company's earnings are in U.S. dollars, and the U.S. dollar is appreciated. You know, the stock price doesn't yet reflect that, and we think it will over time. But again, great company, great management, very, very cheap stock. Shouldn't trade it 19 times earnings. It makes no sense to us. Yeah, well, look, when we spoke previously, I mean, shortly after the Universal deal, uh, you told us that you just stepped out of an investment meeting uh, where you were looking uh, seriously at a new idea. Now, I mean, you must have had many more of those meetings since then. Is, is there anything sort of catching your eye at the moment? Um, anything that you're working on? It, you won't tell us exactly what, but any clues? Well, we've we put on a number of other, we've been spending a lot more time looking at kind of interesting asymmetric uh, macro type instruments. And that's been a very profitable uh, you know, place for us. We've probably made $2.7 billion of profits uh, on interest rate related hedges, uh, and that's system wide. So about ninety percent of that's in Pershing Square Holdings. We made a fortune on credit default swaps, another two point six billion dollars in twenty twenty. And you know, uh, we've always done these sort of hedges, but I think we're building a little bit more of a competency. And and uh, so we've, I would say that most of the new investments we've made in the short term have been relatively modest in size. You know, instruments where we think, you know, if the world macro events play out the way we expect could become enormously valuable. You know, those interest rate hedge investments kind of totaled under 400 million and they turned into 
$2.7 billion, um, you know, it's hard to do that in equities, uh, certainly in the short term. So, you know, we love the super high quality, long duration businesses we own. That's kind of the engine of long-term growth at Pershing Square Holdings. And then opportunistically, we think there are occasionally things to do on the macro uh, options or credit default swaps or swaptions or other or other instruments. And, and we've been spending a lot of time this year and finding some interesting you know, uh, investments. I would say today that those investments uh, are still a very relatively small part of the portfolio, but they have the potential to become quite, uh, quite large. We haven't identified a new stock to buy, um, but you know, this is a super volatile environment and uh, you know, the benefit of some of the realized profits from our hedges is that we can deploy them in undervalued equities. And uh, we're, you know, we have a list of companies that uh, at a price we would own, and they're getting closer to that price. You made huge bets on credit default swaps, as you uh, just said, um, during the pandemic, and then on a, a spike in inflation. Um, I mean, as you again, you made the trust billions of dollars. Um, do you have any similar trades running at the moment, or rather, are there any market bets you think might make sense in the coming months? Yes, and, and generally, actually, to point out, they tend not to be. They tend to be very large notional bets, meaning uh, the, the the size of the insurance policy is quite large, but the cost of the insurance, or the cost of the hedge, is generally quite small relative to the size of the policy. So we like that, as I like to use the word asymmetry. Uh, so they tend not to be things where we're exposing a lot of capital uh, to the risk of loss. Um, but if they work, you know, they, they can be meaningful. And yes, we've entered into several new such hedge type. Uh, bets uh, different from ones we've done in the past, um, and I think partly it's it's such a volatile world, and uh, you know, and we're monitoring lots of different, you know, there are lots of different everything from commodities to interest rates to uh, currencies that can affect uh, you know business values, and uh, you know if we have a different view. From others, generally, we can make those investments on very, very attractive terms. And so we like having a small portfolio of those kind of bets, if you will, as part of the portfolio. So that's really the only new stuff we've done in the last, you know, several months. Are you able to give us any details on those trades, Bill? We can't, unfortunately. Um, it, I think we always like to share everything we can, but nothing that would be a competitive disadvantage to PSH, and I think sharing that stuff at this stage would be a competitive disadvantage. But at certain points in time, we're happy to share our thesis, like on interest rates. If you go, if you follow us on Twitter, or you follow me on Twitter, I, uh, you know, I think we've been pretty prescient about had you just actually built a trading account around <laughs> our views on interest rates or our public statements on interest rates, would have done quite well. I mean, of all those trades, I mean, again, you've mentioned uh, of those you can mention, you've. Uh... You've talked about the credit default swaps and inflation, or it can be a stock or, or, or a hedge. Which of those trades are you most proud of? Which are your best calls? Um, I think we made a very good call on COVID, obviously, and I think we were very early and well rewarded on on interest rates. Um, so those those have been. If we want to do well for our investors, and obviously uh, we've had some very nice multiples of investment capital that are that are material. And big contributors over the last, you know, four or five years. And one of the, if you, I don't know if you had a chance to read our semi-annual letter, but I actually took the time, something I hadn't done before, and looked up the largest, the hundred largest closed-end fund in the world, and was kind of surprised to learn that we were second by net asset value, uh, third by market cap, and that's because of the discount to NAV, uh, but the best performing uh, in one year, two year, three year, five year. Uh, you know, timeframes by a lot. Uh, and the other sort of anomalous data point is the discount to NAV was by far the widest of the 200. I think the average discount was something in the kind of, you know, mid to higher single digits to NAV. So I, Lee, it's up to you to figure out why that yawning gap uh, exists. We also have the largest ownership uh, other than I think one or two entities, one being like a hundred year old trust uh, you know, uh, to any, you know, of the shares of any, of, you know, management. 
So I think you get the most alignment. You've had the best performance, certainly in the last, you know, one through five years. You've had uh, the historic record over 19 years has been, you know, six, 700 basis, maybe more, I think 700 basis points per annum above our, our logical benchmark. So at some point we'll be recognized. Um, we look forward to that day. You've been active uh, in the market uh, fairly recently. I know you sold uh, your stake in Domino's Pizza over the summer. Um, have you been buying and selling anything else, Bill? No. No, we own you know, really the same things we've owned. I mean, nothing materially. We we always make adjustments. Uh, the, the private funds that we have have capital flows in and out. And as a result, in order to keep the funds proportional, you'll see often in our 13F, you know, a small amount of trading. Um, but uh, we, we have bought, uh, you know, some more universal music uh, in a couple of the co-investment vehicles that we, we manage. It's already, I would say, quite a full position in PSH. So we haven't added to it. Um, but if it were a smaller position, I certainly would. But we, we bought universal stock as recently as the last few days uh, for our co-investment vehicles. So, so the money from uh, Domino's, um, I mean, what are, you, are there any plans uh, for that earmarks for, for anything? I mean, are there any company sectors that you're particularly keen on uh, that you're tracking at the moment? Where might that Domino's money go? Uh, we're looking for a great company to invest in. We're using it to buy back stock and a small amount for interesting hedges that we find. We obviously don't identify our targets in advance. Uh, you know, I and other members of the team are doing work on a number of companies that we think are interesting, um, but nothing's gotten yet to a price where we're excited to own it. I mean, for equities, I think more broadly, I mean, uh, lots of talk of a roaring 20s. I mean, is that still possible uh, for the equity market or should investors expect lower returns than they've been used to over the, over the past uh, um, uh, decade? Look, it's it's much easier to make money in the stock market in a rising stock market environment. And if you know rates, a declining interest rate environment isn't is generally a market in which asset prices increase. And so a rising tide lifts all boats. So if you just own equities, I think you know we're so right now we're in a rising interest rate environment. So that's obviously more challenging. And really, I think that what matters is. Are, are the central banks around the world going to stop this uh, out of control inflation? I would say, I think they will. Uh, and where, you know, what's the new level of long-term inflation? Is it going to be? Are we in a world where it's difficult to create? You know, with a federal you know, as recently as I don't know, 24 months ago, uh, central banks around the world were worried about deflation, um, and uh, that's been a very, very dramatic change. And so I think, um, I think you can do very well as a stock market investor if you find really high quality companies and you buy them at attractive prices. And I think today, you know, is a pretty good time. It's a pretty good point of entry, right? You know, March of twenty was obviously a very, very good entry point. And anyone who bought stocks in March of twenty twenty, something I went on TV and advocated um, on March eighteenth of twenty twenty, you know, I said this is a, this is a moment. I think this is sort of another moment where I don't know how well you're going to do over the next three or six months, 12 months, it's this highly uncertain world, but over the next three, four, five, 10 years, it's a pretty good place to, to be an investor or time to commit more capital to equity markets. Although I would, you got you to pick carefully. You want to own the super high quality, well-capitalized, dominant businesses that you know will be here you know, 30 years from now. And that's why we own companies like Hilton and and universal music and restaurant brands and so on. So what you're saying, whether whether or not there's a Q4 correction or whatever, that doesn't really matter. If you're looking further out a few years, three, four, five years out, now's a good time. You'll look back on, on today and think, well, yeah, that was a good time to buy. For sure. That doesn't mean the market's not going lower in the next three months, right? It's uh but you know, I wouldn't commit all of your capital today, right? Keep some in revert reserve, you know, a bit of the as they used to call it dollar cost averaging. It's, you know, s and is down, you know, approaching 20% for the year. And it wasn't highly overvalued uh, at the beginning of the year. So I think prices are fair to, to cheap. Well, I mean, you, you've kind of answered my, my question, my final question. Where, where do you see uh, Pershing Square in five years' time? I mean, will the, two question, will the persistent discount in London 
see you list in in, in the US. Um, I, either way, we, you'll stick to your uh, current strategy. I guess is it a core portfolio of around ten stocks with opportunistic hedges? Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think the strategy is not going to change, um, but we're going to keep working at the discount thing. And I'm, what I would say there, um, you know, we talked about in the letter that a way in which we could be listed, I think the right place ultimately for a U.S. managed portfolio of North American companies is, you know, logically uh, in the U.S. And if there's a way for us to get there uh, within the rules, you know, we're going to figure it out. And, uh, you know, part of my day job is helping the companies we own uh, optimize their businesses and get the valuations uh, in the market that they deserve. And uh, we're putting some thought and energy into it for ourselves. But in the meantime, uh, I am enjoying buying back 50, 60,000 shares a day uh, at today's prices. I just think that's um, a good deal. But it's the best deal I know in, in markets. Focusing on, on companies, and, and uh, I reflect back to that you mentioned earlier the uh, Netflix, the, uh, the decision to to exit the Netflix um, uh, uh, investment, which was, I, th I think, seen broadly as, as a brave decision and ultimately the right one for you. And making big calls like that was, I think, also a great example for retail investors. So, I mean, for, for them, I mean, what are your three red flags or red flags that mean you should sell a company, um, even if it's at a loss? Sure. So, uh, number one, uh, Netflix is a great business, uh, Reed Hastings and the management team have built a remarkable company and it's brought uh, delight to um, consumers and people uh, you know, all over the world. Almost everyone has a Netflix subscription, but that's part of the problem, right? The problem, in order for the business to be uh, a valuable business over time, they have to continue to grow at a pretty rapid rate, at least now. And, and what intrigued us initially was when the stock went from 700 to the high 300s, uh, if they continue, if the long-term growth rates were within the relevant range of where they had been historically, that was a very undervalued stock. And um, our thesis, based on you know what we, the due diligence we had done and what management had stated, is that the the miss in subscriber growth in the quarter was more sort of COVID-related, difficult to predict, and not due to kind of reaching a headroom of of potential growth. And I think that the you should sell an investment when you learn new information, which is inconsistent with the original thesis. And the new information we learned was that uh, the number of non-paying subscribers, you know, so-called password sharing subscribers, was much, much higher than we thought. And uh, to get someone from going to from being a free Netflix customer to being a paying customer when they've been enjoying the service for free is not this can be quite challenging. And when you add the kind of existing base of subscribers to the to the uh, the subscribers that had had a free ride, if you will, you were kind of hitting up, you know, closer to the the number of smart TVs today in the world, and so, you know, that uh, ability to grow, you know, the, the miss in the quarter and the miss in in the second quarter, you know, may not be probably not COVID related, in fact, but rather because you're getting closer to the the ultimate uh, limits of growth, at least on the on based on existing smart. Uh, smartphone or even uh, a smart TV uh, penetration. So that was a, a real concern. And then the second thing uh, that was a kind of inconsistent with the original thesis is that, you know, Reed Hastings hated advertising uh, and never wanted advertising on Netflix. And they kind of acknowledged, well, in order to make the math work, to make the business model work, we're going to have to go to an ad supported tier in our pricing. And that's something they have no experience with. And our business is finding companies where we can predict with a very, very high degree of confidence what a business looks like uh, it, 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 over a very long period of time. And, and the only way to, to value a company uh, in our mind is not, you know, just pick a multiple next year's earnings. I mean, that's maybe a trading way to think about the value of business. It's an, it's an interesting heuristic, but the right way to think about a business is find a business where you can predict with a high degree of confidence what the cash flows would be over many, many years and build them up. And we lost the ability to build a model with Netflix because the dispersion of potential outcomes, you know, ad-supported streaming is successful or it's not, or 
what you know if the growth rate is slower than we expected or it's not you know it, it um you know the, the risk profile change and the predictability of change so, so we sold so i guess the advice to a retail investor would be if you bought tesla because you love the cars um you you thought you were paying a fair price for the stock and you thought it was going to grow on some kind of basis and then another you know lucid or someone else or bmw comes out with a car that's much better than tesla and you expect all of a sudden tesla not to have its some, some monopolistic share of the business you know you, you should sell you should sell so if you have a thesis going in um and then new facts emerge that are inconsistent with the thesis you know, generally if you keep twisting the thesis come up with a reason for owning the stock it's going to be a problem and uh we're it didn't take much courage for us to sell um you know we, we sold because it was the economically rational thing to do and it, and for me it's never it it take you know Courage is not required. You do, you know, we're very visible. You know, everything we do is big. And so a mistake, the numbers will be large. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of used to that. And we don't like making mistakes. Yeah. We don't, we don't make that many. But if we make one, you're going to read about it in the newspaper. And it's going to sound really big. And so Netflix was a, you know, $400 million, a lot of money to lose around the Persian Square Funds whatever the exact number was, or 400 basis points of uh, profit. But, you know, this is a high return strategy and we can afford to lose 400 basis points. We'll be fine. I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball and, and give a view on inflation and Fed rate policy. I know you have written about it at length. Uh, but for our viewers, uh, who, will, who will want to know, I mean, are we nearing peak inflation and, and where will the Fed funds rate peak and when? Sure. I think we are nearing peak inflation. Uh, I think. This most recent number was a surprise to the upside, particularly on the good side. And you know what's interesting about you know interest managing interest rate policy, the job the Federal Reserve has to do, is that the data sort of seems to be always wrong, you know, and, and constantly being revised. And um, we were, I would say, surprised certainly on the good side of the CPI number. Goods inflation was higher than what sort of anecdotally we. We perceive is is happening in the world, and and I would say it was maybe you know lower in, in a previous CPI print, and, and and maybe averaging the last two CPI prints probably gets you closer to what the actual monthly inflation is. We, we do think inflation is moderating. Uh, obviously, at least in the U.S., gas prices have come down, uh, you know, quite meaningfully, um, and you're seeing you know some moderation in in wage inflation, and clearly in goods inflation and you know transportation costs are kind of coming down supply chain issues are sort of in process of being resolved and we think that leads to a tempering inflation and then of course the federal reserve is being aggressive i mean, I mean the the uh really clear uh maybe reinforcement of what the federal reserve was trying to say uh up until uh mr powell's uh, you know august Jackson Hole remarks. I think the world kind of woke up that the Fed was serious. So I think now the market is pricing in even more aggressive interest rate increases in the short term than the Federal Reserve has suggested. And I think the market maybe actually, uh, you know, it was the expectations were too low before, and they may be too high now. I'm not convinced the Federal Reserve is going to raise rates to four and a quarter percent by the end of the year. Uh, I think they may go more slowly than that. But I think. You know, uh, the so-called terminal rate, uh, you know, likely will be something with a four in front of it. And we'll probably probably get there by sometime in Q1. And I think you'll start to see a moderation in in the CPI numbers over the next uh, several months. And certainly we hope that's the case. Um, I think a more interesting question, and I would say more relevant to the value of companies, is long-term inflation and long-term interest rates. And that's where I think. Uh, the Federal Reserve's view that you know we're going to keep policy tight until we get back to two percent. I'm not sure we're getting back to two percent. I feel like it's a different. We woke up in a different world in 2022 uh, than the world that came before, where it was hard to get to keep inflation at two percent, right? And I think you know the war in Ukraine. I think uh, you know the China Taiwan potential conflict. And the supply chain problems that people are having, you know, all of these things point businesses to, to you know, I want to have more control 
uh, I don't want politics to interfere with my supply chain. And so I think you're going to see a lot more manufacturing being brought closer to home. I think Mexico will be a big beneficiary. Uh, the United States, I think, will be a beneficiary of that. Um, but that's expensive. And I think, uh, you know, the sort of ESG movement is also expensive uh, in terms of the incremental cost to be a, to be a more carbon neutral uh, world. The transition to alternative energy is going to be expensive. Uh, so I don't, I'm not confident the Federal Reserve is going to get inflation back to 2%. And I think they may have to, at some point, say, look, we're going to accept, you know, maybe 25 or 3% kind of longer term inflation. So I think that's a, a story that has yet to be written. But uh, that strikes me as sort of more interesting. I mean, a lot, a lot of focus, obviously, on the Fed in the short term. That's more for traders. You know, we, we own, and it's, it's relevant to us as we hedge some of those you know, use some of those instruments. But what really matters to a long-term owner of equities is what's the long-term risk-free rate, right? Because these, you know, universal music is a forever asset. So when you value it, you discount the cash flows back at a at a uh, long-term interest rate, uh, you know, discount rate. And so what the risk-free rate is, that that's the base on which you add a risk premium. And if it's going to be three, you know, if inflation is going to be three instead of two, you know, that means something for long-term rates and, and long-term values. So, so companies with pricing power are going to uh, be the premium, what would you imagine? Yeah, and I think we own them. You know, if you look at our businesses, we, we love businesses that have kind of royalty-like characteristics. Universal owns a royalty on music. So if Spotify raises prices, we get an immediate benefit. Uh, uh, restaurant brands owns a royalty on, you know, Burger King hamburgers and a Coke and a fry or a Popeye's chicken sandwich. And if they raise prices, we get a royalty, an immediate benefit from that. Uh, and uh, same thing's true for Hilton. You know, as room rates go up, uh, that's, uh, you know, again, and, and hotel real estate is really the only real estate where you can reprice your rents every day, uh, which is good in a world where you think hotel rents or room rates are so-called rev bar is going to go up you know, sort of over time. So I think we own... We've always been interested in owning assets and companies with pricing power. The best businesses in the world have pricing power. And we only, always wanted to own businesses that were protected from inflation, but we never had inflation. <laughs> so now we do, and we're, we're glad we own what we own. The recession it is, is you know, fairly likely. I mean, do you, do you see that as a you know, fairly long and severe or just a short, sharp you know, technical recession? Look, I, I don't think it's knowable whether or not we're going to have a recession. Um, you know, it used to be we had economic cycles with recessions. It's been an awfully long time. But if you know the Federal Reserve got behind in, in raising rates and now they're going to have to be more aggressive. I mean, it, it, you look at what's going on in housing. You know, people got used to a 3% uh, mortgage rate and now it's 6 plus. Um, and that's causing housing market to slow down fairly rapidly. Housing is a pretty, a very important part of our economy. Um, so if rate rises have that effect more broadly, uh, then I think it's likely that you're going to have a recession. If the if what we the Fed raises rates pretty quickly, which is what we you know our kind of recommendation more than uh, more than a year ago, uh, and you can sort of cut cut off inflation and get it trending in the right direction, then they they won't have to be as severe and and don't have to if you will force us into a severe recession. But I think I think sometime in 2023, you know, it's absolutely within the realm of possibility that we're going to have a recession for sure. Great. Bill Ackman, CEO of Pershing Square Holdings, thanks very much for joining me today. Thank you very much. Lee.